Five, four, this is the first time I ever had to do this. This is how excited I am. Three, two, one. And we're here. It's American Inc. I'm Luke Wildman. I'm here with a very interesting person that I'm super excited to introduce you guys to. My good friend, Mr. Jason Asai. How are you doing? Doing great. How are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. Did I say that right, Asai? I know. Osei. Osei. It's, it's okay. It's Osei. okay. O-S-E-I. O-S-E-I. Osei. That's a really cool name. I mean, it's it's from Ghana. Like, you know, my parents are Ghana. originally from Ghana. And so, um, Osei, it, they, uh, I don't know what it really means. I know that it's like got something to do with like being noble, but I don't know how true that is. That, so I, your family is from Ghana. Mm-hmm. Wow. Now, is everyone there extra large? Um, <laughs> actually, considering like um, a lot of people will say that like I'm a an anomaly. Oh, so okay. Usually, people aren't as as big. My dad was pretty big, so <laughs> you know I kind of got most of his uh, his size and his height. My brother's actually taller than I am. He's not as big and stacked, but he's taller than I am. So I know that sounds like a, a strange question if you're watching right now, and I'm just asking about your, how big your family is. Uh, first off, it, let me introduce Jason a, a little bit. Uh, we met not too long ago. Uh, we both train. My son trains at Ion Jiu-Jitsu here in Sulphur Springs. Uh, and I know you just had your first uh, MMA fight. Yeah. Which you were victorious yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, gas monkey against a, a young man that was very large. You're what, 6'4"? 6'4". 6'4". I mean, whenever I walked into the gym and I understood that I was going to have to roll with you, <laughs> <laughs> there may have been a slight bit of urination that took part <laughs> in the process. <laughs> But uh, th- this guy that you that you fought against for your first fight, Deshai, was a really tall guy. It's like six eight, six nine, six nine, six nine. Very mm-hmm. big guy. Uh, but anyways, uh, it's really interesting the path that you've taken to get here. You know, your 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 family is from Ghana, but you're you're kind of a hometown guy these days. I know you've spent some time at Baylor, uh, but you've also spent some time at Texas A&M Commerce uh, before we were able to uh, get to see what you're doing with the the MMA thing. Which I think is really cool. I, I got to hear some of this story about how you got to where you are right now. Did it start with football? Is that Was that the sport that kind of got you going as far as competitive sports go? No, actually. So I used to play basketball and soccer back in the day. Mm-hmm. And so when I kind of like was playing basketball, um, especially at sixth form college, so the progression from in England schools – is you go from well wait back up back up back up okay so now I'm hearing the the English accent and I noticed they called you the Londoner on mm-hmm. your fight card uh, we'll get to that in a second but please continue the story I just needed to illuminate that fact you have a really cool accent it's it's all right it's all right <laughs> not real common around Texas you know? not real hey, it's from Odessa <laughs> okay okay so continuing on with the story you played a lot of basketball. Mm-hmm. And so um, the progression in England is you go from primary school to secondary school, and then you go to what's called sixth form college, mm-hmm. and then you go to university. And so uh, in sixth form college, I played basketball for our sixth form college team. And then um, I would go and play around the neighborhood, and this guy came and asked me if I wanted to um, play American football. And I was a little bit skeptical because I was like, I haven't really played the sport before. So I said no at first. And he would keep on coming back um, multiple times to ask me to play. And then eventually I just said, um, okay, I'll try it. Because at least if I try it one time and I don't like it, then I can say I did it. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to do it no more. But I have to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I did it and I actually enjoyed it. And then um, I ended up going to Finland at some point and um, played there for a season. And then that's where I got the highlight tape that she got me to go to Baylor because the coaches saw it. In Finland? In Finland. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. I didn't even know they had football. Or uh, football is big in Europe now. It's, well, really? it's, it's getting bigger now. There's, wow. a, there's a lot of leagues around um, around Europe, especially in different countries, and um, you will see that they got like fan bases. Really? People take a really big interest in it. It's getting really big. You know, I I'm a little older than you. You may not remember, but I mean, I, I imagine you probably do. But whenever NFL Europa yeah. went away, mm-hmm. I thought surely that would be the end. No, if anything, a lot of those players and those teams actually got grandfathered into different leagues. So you'll find, especially in Germany, where I think it's got Germany and Austria have the biggest football followings right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll find a lot of the teams that used to be NFL Europa teams will have um, number one some coaches who are NFL Europe players. 
they would be actually some of the coaches for these teams. And then you'll find some of the teams inherit some of the names. Oh. And then you'll find that a few of the players themselves still actually play at those leagues. And it's actually become it's, it's actually become professional. Really? In some sense of the word. They get sponsorships. Um, they got stadiums. You know, it's, it's actually really, it's, t- it's taken off. And they pay you. Um, I didn't get paid. But you were still at the amateur level there. Exactly. Okay, but from that, you were, I guess, discovered by Baylor? Mm-hmm. Okay. So really what happened is um, a coach got wind of my highlight tape, mm-hmm. and then um, he sent it out to some schools. And who was your coach at Baylor at the time? Um, I, my coach at Baylor's Bryles. Bri- Art Bryles. Yes, yeah, so okay. my coach at Baylor's okay. Bryles. And, um, but he wasn't the one that recruited me. My coach, my offensive line coach, Coach Clements, he was mm-hmm. the one that recruited me. And um, I didn't actually go for an official visit, so I went into Baylor blind, didn't know what to expect. You didn't know anything about Baylor at the time. Didn't know anything about Baylor (laughs) at the time. Um, Just whatever Coach Clem told me, and really what he said was true. It was going to be a quiet town. Um, It wasn't really much. Waco, what what Waco is now was not what it, it it wasn't like that then. Like, Waco was pretty dead. Really? It was just a small town, but the thing is, when you go there, you make what you make of it. If you go in there to play football, you're gonna get you're gonna get good for football. If you go in there to get an education, you're gonna be good at education. If you go in there to party, you'd be good at partying. You know, <laughs> so it's like whatever you, whatever you wanted to go to Waco for, you would get what you you would get what you want out of it. And, and you were just going there for whatever opportunity may arise. Exactly, and that's wow. that's really what it was. You know, it may be common because the way that their their farm system is set up with the the leagues in Europe, but I think it's kind of an it really is a testament to your physical abilities. Uh, to just used to get basically drafted from this university, which here is huge. You know, that's a temple, a mecca for football fans in this part of the country or part of the world. And for them to bring you all the way over there, pretty cool stuff. I mean, it was it was surreal, um, especially being from England. Not many people get that kind of opportunity. I mean, uh, there was a few people I heard of, like Tom Worth, who played at um, who played at Oklahoma. And then, um, obviously, there was, like, a few players who got to play NFL Europa and then got some good opportunities with some NFL teams. So you get those people players that were few and far between. When you hear about those guys, though, you don't expect yourself to actually be one, you know? Yeah. So it's, it was kind of surreal. If you're humble, I guess. I mean, if, if you're humble and also it's the fact that you put in X amount of hours of working, mm-hmm. sometimes you don't know how it's going to turn out for you. So it's like... You feel to yourself, yeah, I'm working, but I'm still working on a dream. But then when it actually happens, it's like, wow, this is such a kind is of Is that a, like a battle uh, constantly, especially when you're training and dieting and everything? I saw your pictures, and, I, and we're going to have Corey pop these up. Corey, bring up the picture of him before at Baylor. <laughs> and, okay, and now bring up the picture of him after training with Shane and Alan out at Ion. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Total difference. Total difference. So you put yourself through some stuff. But I'm wondering, at the, at the you've done all kinds of training. I know you had to bulk up and everything like that for football. But did, was that a constant battle, like not knowing if this was going to p- be worth it? or? I mean, the thing is, and I think this is probably a lot of people can attest to this, and this is just going outside of athletics but into life. Um, one of the mottos I had is – you don't know when it's going to come. You don't know how it's going to come, but you have to keep working hard for it because when it does come, you have to be ready for it. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew it was something I needed to work for. And uh. the worst thing I think in life for me to ask myself is what if? So what if I had worked out this extra day? What if I had, you know... Ah, uh, Shane hates those questions. What if questions? It's the worst, <laughs> it's the worst questions you can ask yourself because it's like you don't know... Like, it's, if you're asking what if... That means you can't find the answer no more. That means you got to that point where you can't even go back to find the answers. So while you got the ability, while you got the opportunities, while you got the chance, why not find out? Why, why, why not now? You know. And so, for me, it was like you know, there is the the hard times where you get that doubt in your mind, especially when you know you're not really hearing anything. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's one of those things where hey, if I get to that point and I've tried everything I can, and it doesn't work out for me, then at least I found out the answer for myself. You know. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't give up before i found out what at least you tried exactly okay okay exactly. i see you know bring up that picture one more time <laughs> you see that guy right there <laughs> that man is made out of solid steel <laughs> and i can relate to that feeling of i gotta try this <laughs> and uh you know i haven't been back to the gym since halloween i had this uh this fella matter of fact bring his picture up one more time <laughs> We were training for a fight he had. Yeah, that guy right there. <laughs> Corded steel. And uh, I remember 
uh, we were in a position where uh, you were on the ground and you had to reverse the the mount, and which you did effortlessly. <laughs> and one of the times, your shoulder came down on my ribs. My bad. I'm so sorry. No, no. It, this is a funny story because I I did something to them, but I kept going and kept working out as long as I could, and uh, I didn't go to the doctor. And about two months later, <laughs> it turned out I had like pleurisy and a whole bunch of stuff going on because of this man. This, but that's, I mean, that is just like, I'm, I'm not a little guy. I'm 230 pounds. I'm a little on, the, I'm a little out of shape. I'm not going to lie. Oh my gosh. But you're in good shape. I mean, look, okay. Go back to the first picture of him at Baylor. Okay. <laughs> that, that looks like a winter coat. But I promise you, there's nothing but muscle. Now go back to the other picture. That's what is beneath that coating there. And it's amazing. It's just amazing. I can't believe that another guy would get into a cage with you. I, I swear, as soon as I walk up to the cage and I see a guy like you across the ring, I'm turning around and I'm walking back to the locker <laughs> You know, the, I'm sure the adrenaline is flooding on both sides. And I'm trying to jump to your fight here. I know I'm going a little far uh, forward here, but... So excited. It was, it was a great fight. We'll get to it in a minute. Gas Monkey, it was July 12th. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, man, it, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but back, back to your journey. On You know I'm a squirrel here. Hey, go ahead. Back to your journey. Uh, so you're at Baylor. Mm -hmm. You're doing your thing, and, and you actually uh, eventually make your way here to the homeland, to mm -hmm. the motherland, A&M Commerce. And if you could, fill us in a little bit on how that transpired. Well, in my final year at Baylor, um, I picked up a meniscus injury, mm. which um, kind of took me out of spring ball. And so um, at that point, I didn't want to really spend my time in my senior year not playing. Yeah. So I really wanted to um, to play. And so um, I, we talked to a few Southland Conference schools, but the rules in D1 are a little bit different to D2. And so I didn't know if it was going to be a clean transfer at that point. Talking to some coaches, it was about maybe, maybe sitting out a year. And I was like, when they said sit out a year, it's like, I, <laughs> was I going to get to play the next year? Because it's like, if I sit uh. out a year, potentially I could not be playing. And then I would have wasted my time transferring. So then I was kind of like yeah. stuck in two minds about it. And then um, Coach Carthel actually reached out to Baylor because um, he found out I wanted to transfer. And then he was the one that put in a request for me to come to Commerce. And then we found out that instead of one year to play, I actually got two years to play. So it actually worked out better. So it's like, instead of me having just my senior year, I got my junior and my senior year. So, and those two good years playing at Commerce, I enjoyed it a lot. Were yeah. injuries a, a common thing like that, like the meniscus? I mean, things that you have to deal with, or no? That was actually probably my first major injury. And then, um, funny fact: the funny thing is, two weeks into Commerce, um, right before the season even started, I actually tore my TFCC ligament in my wrist. So I played the whole season in a cast. So I was actually oh playing my the whole season in one hand. And, you know, I know the A&M was glad to get you uh, because, it, I mean, and we'll pull this up, too. They're so happy to have you that if you guys are traveling to any of the local airports in DFW, you may see a picture of Jason. <laughs> You're on billboards, too, right? I know. It's kind of cool. <laughs> When I, when I look back and see that, it's like, it's kind of crazy. You're the face of Texas A&M Commerce. When people say that, it's kind of crazy because if, if they actually knew how, like, lazy I am, I think people <laughs> would actually probably be more surprised. Like, I live a really, not humble lifestyle in terms of, like, how to put it. All right, let me, let me, get, let me, let, right, when I say humble, I'm a really humble person. Mm -hmm. When I say humble lifestyle, like, I mean, I live a really simple lifestyle. Like, like a monk. Not even like a, I would say, uh, that's probably, probably a, I wish I could live like a monk. Like, you know, that takes a lot of dedication and um, not that simple. <laughs> not that simple, but I live a really simple lifestyle where I just kind of like do the same things every day. Like you know, it's nothing, nothing extravagant. You know, you know, you think of it as being simple, but for for the rest of us normal people, to be so disciplined to just do what you have to do, what you need to do, is almost impossible. I mean. And this is where I talked to somebody the other day because um, somebody actually said to me, Jason, you're an inspiration. You know, you, you do some inspirational stuff. And I had to kind of like pause them and sit back to them and say, I'm not really inspirational. I'm just a guy that's just doing the stuff that he wants to. And I think, and I said to them, the reason why I say that is not to. Um, that's so cool too. 
Because you could have a big head. Yeah. You but, could. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> you're smart. You're you're a, 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 a handsome man. <laughs> you're in great physical shape. You know, you could do anything you want to. Uh, and you could. You know, you could be overconfident. But, you're, but you are humble. Yeah, but the thing is, I think at the end of the day, everybody can do whatever they want to. It's just you have to – you just have to just believe that you can do it. And I think, you know – Instead of putting like people on a pedestal, because I don't want people to put me on a pedestal and like make me seem like I'm this great guy, it's like no. Instead of doing that, you should kind of like say, hey, I, if I, if there's something I want to do, like if I wanted to be like the best chef in the world, I can do that. You know, I, well, I don't, it might take a lot of time and effort, but you know that effort and that time is gonna pay off somehow. And it's like I, that's why I said to people, don't put me on a pedestal because it's like making it seem like I'm doing something that's superhuman and out of anybody's reach. It's like simplify it like you know just do what i want to do i I think people strive for that and i think that's why it's so inspirational to to be like that because to be humble like you are because dude i'm telling you like if i had bring up more time if i had (laughs) this guy this guy's body i'm telling you sun's out guns out 24 7 if i didn't have a convertible i'd cut the top off my truck and drive around town just so everyone could see (laughs) humble has got to be hard to do it's hard to do for it for any of us but it is inspirational but you know then you say something like that and it's just kind of like it loops right back around to to being well-rounded i guess and, and humble that's a really cool thing though man so what what years did you play at uh commerce here um 2015 2016 2015 and 2016 and they won the uh championship in 2017 i know they had to they had, when, to, go, they had to go they had to wait till i left to do it did you get there after tyreek left um so, oh yeah so tyreek rollison just so he had left he's a sulfur springs legend if, if you don't know oh yeah no, so i heard about he has a statue uh, he should he has a stadium that they should name after him because we couldn't build it if he didn't want that championship <laughs> man that guy had an arm oh no he oh, was man. good he was good i wow. think i think they were kind of worried um after he left because i know he left the season before i started mm-hmm. but harrison and then luis perez you know they came and took over the show uh, and did great like we won championships yeah and um and that kid perez. perez wow man so much talent at AM these days see but the thing is i think with perez i think the one thing that um people didn't see which is why I respect him so much, and I think you know he was one of the greatest guys to play for. It's just the time that he put in outside of football. I mean, he would be here training in the weight room. He'd be in the field training, getting like talking to the O line, training us, and then he, the amount of time he spent in the film room, like you know that guy knew the game of football. Like, that's what they do. That position, that's what they do, man. Well, really, that's what you got to do in every position, but especially that. Oh yeah, and but it's like with Perez, I think the. The one thing is he made it a lifestyle. Really? And that's why when he won the Harlan Hill Trophy, people were like, man, like, you know, that's kind of crazy. It's like, I, I wasn't surprised. I'm like, if you saw he, You saw how hard he worked for it. You'd like, understand. Yeah. Like, wow. He ate, he ate, drank, slept. Everything was greatness. Like, not in football, it's greatness. That's what makes the great ones. I mean, look at Brady. Look mm-hmm. at Brady. We're getting ready to see him in, what, 48 hours? Yeah. About we'll 48 hours from now. Yeah, I, I, I want him to win. You know, I mean, I... I'm a little bittersweet about the whole deal because I am glad to see Brady back in it again, but I really would have liked to see Drew Brees and him go at it. I know. At 40 and 41. Yeah, but that's the controversial call. Oh, man. It almost ruined me on football. I'm, I'm not. We're talking about the pass interference call that, between the Rams and the Saints. I... I almost I did I said I wasn't gonna watch the Super Bowl. Of course I'm gonna watch the Super Bowl, but mm-hmm. I was that angry when I saw that call, man. Like it made me question everything about football, the gambling, and now with Vegas being involved, and because there were so many referees, I saw at least two referees looking straight at the receiver. I don't know. What do you think? See, for me, and this is probably gonna sound, I guess, probably very political. But I understand. Like as as a referee, you're human. You're gonna you you have a you have. But dude, I, it's it's the fact is like you know, there's two more, there's two ways about it, right? The New Orleans Saints, who are probably the best team in the NFL, right? Mm-hmm. They let it get close. Mm-hmm. So you want to? We always get told this by the coaches. You want to if you if you if you're dominant on the team, you want to make sure that you don't even make the referees a factor. The referees became a factor, and they're playing against a good Rams team, which is we can't discount the Rams. The Rams are a good team. They're yeah, oh yeah, this, this whole season. We saw what they did to the Cowboys. Yeah, they they, they put the hurting on those guys right there. <laughs> but at the same time, 
the referees, they're human. They're gonna make errors, you know. Yeah. And the thing is, I I, I understand. It's just it was so obvious that it made me question the the uh, integrity of of the referees as a whole. And I and I I literally I've started to question things like I know just a couple years ago they legalized gambling for the NFL, and you know everyone talks about the mafia's ties into. Uh, betting sports betting and of course las vegas and and you gotta wonder i do wonder i'm of course i'm a conspiracy guy yeah <laughs> we'll get into aliens and all that stuff on another day <laughs> but it, it did have me wonder but you're right if you let them back in if you leave the gate open and they come on in i mean it's really you can't blame anybody but yourself so i mean i can understand that but dang when you look at that video i know i, I looked at it and i was i was shocked because i looked at it and it's like that's like a. That's like not even like subtle. That's a blatant pass interference, like call, because he definitely beheaded the guy. You know, <laughs> took his head clean, his off. Head clean off, smoked him. Like I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like that was that was. Probably he got like, jacked up, like legit. Like he got turned inside out. I was like, wait, hold on a second, ref. I mean, we need to blow that one. But at the same time, I was like, you know what? He had a call to make. You know, it's. Uh, it's a it's a high pressure game. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff running high. You know, everybody's gonna make mistakes, and I mean, when we look back on it, it's gonna be probably a big one. The New Orleans Saints should rightfully be mad about it. Um, but I think you know, at this point right now, it's how do you bounce back? You know, so I think if the Saints can like you know kind of say you know what, yeah, it happened, but next year we're gonna we're gonna put it on and come back and come back stronger. Then I think I, I think they should do well. At forty two, you think Drew Brees can do it again? I mean, we told Brett, Brett Favre was one of the best in the game, and you know he was 40, 40 plus, and he yeah, still was yeah. you know taking the Green Bay Packers places. And, and you know, I think these guys now talking about Brady and Brees. I, honestly, I think they're on a whole different level than even Favre was. You know, Brady says forty five, and he's dead serious. And I'm starting to think maybe he really can do it. Yeah, his arm is diminishing. But how many years did we see Peyton Manning's arm? That was, you know, nothing like it used to be. Uh, and they still won a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. Okay, maybe they will come back next year. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think the Rams have a chance in the Super Bowl. See, the thing is now, I always the – the quirky thing is I feel like every year that the Patriots lose a Super Bowl, the next year they go into winning. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's kind of been an interesting – because they've been in the Super Bowl, f like, pretty much – That's actually exactly what I was thinking, though. They've been. This is the ninth trip since Brady. Yeah, this is the ninth trip. So they've, <laughs> they've been. They've been to Super Bowl a bunch of times, but we need to go back to when they lost to the New York Giants the first time. Oh yeah. And it was sixteen and zero, and everybody thought they had it sewn up. Uh. And that, that D line came out of nowhere, and we need to understand the Rams have been Kung Su. They have a good. Yeah, they, they, they do. Pretty... I can't believe. I still. I remember. I remember. This trade was on the, or this acquisition was on the level of what we just seen yesterday with uh, Christoph Porzingis and uh, Luka Doncic being mm -hmm. on the same team. I cannot believe, still today, that they have Aaron Donald and Ndamukong Sue lining up next to each other. It should be illegal. But the thing is, is like Sue has been Cadillac and kind of sandbagging the whole season, and then he gets up into the playoff games and the championship rounds, and man. Hey, different stakes, wow. different stakes. Because uh, he's trying to get paid. I know it's a it's a free agent year after this for him. Mm -hmm. But, whoo! But you really think that they got a chance? I mean, the thing is with the Super Bowl, like even when we saw, um, was it who who? It was it the Seahawks versus the Broncos when they got like absolutely the Broncos got absolutely trounced that year, and it was a blowout. Oh, uh, what think, year? What year? I think it was the Seahawks because it may be. Yeah, when was, Russell Wilson. Yeah, Russell Wilson. I, the score oh my was gosh, like fifty something, and it was like they got they got trounced. And everybody thought it was gonna be a tight game, but how did this? How does this Super Bowl pass my memory? I mean, because 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 I've got Cowboys fever is no, why. That and, they, and they got trounced. No one wants to remember. No that. one wants to remember that. Yeah, no one wants to remember that. And so I think. Did they have Manning as a quarterback then? Yeah, they had Manning as a quarterback. Oh wow, and it was an absolute beating. Wow. It was a beating. And the next year, the... They come back? No, the Seahawks lost to the Patriots. And that... Uh, that, and that with the pick okay. Six in the, the pick okay, now I'm... The haze is clearing. The mm -hmm. haze is clearing. Uh, football, man, I 
I'm I don't have NFL Sunday ticket. I haven't for a while. Next year I'm going to. I just cut the cord. Mm -hmm. I got the Apple TV service. Next year I'm getting the NFL Sunday ticket at the beginning of the season. Uh, but I'm the kind of fan that if I can, I will watch every single game. And then the Cowboys game, I have a tendency to turn a three to four hour game into a six or seven hour <laughs> event because I like to pause and rewind and pause and rewind over and over again. But that's American football. Yeah. It's high action. It's high intensity. Do you remember the first time that you suited up and, and did a scrimmage or a hamburger drill? The first time you got a real impact with somebody wearing the, the pads and all? Oh, I still remember that. Do you remember the, the sensation thinking, wow, this is different? Or was there ever that moment? I think... I guess the difference was um, I wanted that moment, but then again, it was like um, when you're in a completely different scenario. So like I'm a, I'm across the pond. I'm out of college. I'm an English guy playing in American football with American guys. These guys are great high level athletes. So it's like I don't have anything special. Like these, everybody's special. Yeah. The difference is that. Wow. So your first experience is like with people that have been doing it for a while and are better than everybody else they played with up until that point. Yeah. And it's, wow. I, I mean, you're, play, you're playing. With, you're playing with like you know the cream of the cream. Like you know you're, you're a D one athlete. So it's like you're, you if you're here, you're not you're not a joke. Yeah. You're a, you know you're you're here because you're good, and so for me it was kind of like more of like a proving ground. Like where it's like now I have to, I have to show that I'm worth you know the time and the effort and the money. You know. Wow. And so it's like. The excitement is there, but it's more, it's, it's different. You're, it's, it's like more like I'm, I'm excited, but I'm focused. Like that, this, I've got a completely different train of thought about what I'm trying to do here. Man, I remember the first few times I got my bell rung. I remember specifically in the ninth grade in a scrimmage and a, a guy named Andy Garcia ran me over on a kick return. <laughs> and he was a quarterback of the team at the time. And, uh, I remember he was running up the sideline, and I tried to take his legs out from it, from him, and I think my helmet hit his thigh or something, and I saw stars. I'm like, damn, this is real, man. These they're hitting hard, you know. But I guess when you're you're in in good shape and you're a big, strong man, <laughs> a full size man, we'll say full man size. Uh, that kind of stuff probably doesn't get into your head. But I remember being a, a scrawny little kid. Of course, I was undersized as a kid. I, I wasn't as well fed as I am. <laughs> but so you 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 spent 2015 2016 at A&M doing that stuff and uh I know you told me before that you've you've done some uh mixed martial arts boxing and kickboxing other things like that before uh you wound up at Ion uh jiu -jitsu. uh but I'd like to illuminate that that path cuz I think it's really interesting whenever you told me all the different things that you've done uh and, and where you have been. And, of course, I know everybody's dying to hear about that thick London accent that you got. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that thick. It's not. But uh, tell us a little bit about that side of you. Well, I mean, in terms of martial arts, my cousin, who's also – he's a professional MMA fighter. Um, really? He's been a big influence in my martial arts career. Um, I started off with Taekwondo, um, got up to my yellow at belt. Age. At age? Ooh, that was probably at age 16. Like, really? Yeah, so I, I did, I, I've been in martial arts for a while. And then um, I kind of stayed in that for a while. Then afterwards, kind of like um, funneled into judo and um, shidokan karate, which is pretty much, um, it's pretty much kickboxing and like MMA karate. Mm -hmm. But it's got like a lot of emphasis on like Japanese culture as well. And then um, judo was, um, judo was kind of like, a nice setup from Shido Shido Khan to get mm -hmm. the groundwork and also the takedown work, and then I did boxing as well, and um, I did that all. Then literally had to stop it when I came to America to play football, ah. and then picked it up after um, I graduated at Commerce because really I was just doing it to stay fit, you know. So I said I'm gonna come and, and do like you know some grappling and some um, some martial arts just kind of stay fit in addition to the running and gym work that I was doing. And then um, afterwards, Shane and Alan kind of thought like, hey, like you're pretty decent. Like maybe we should start getting you into some fights, you know. <laughs> pretty quick, I'm guessing. Um, actually, no. <laughs> I remember you all talking about, yeah, we're going to get him in a fight. And then a few weeks later, it seemed like you were in a fight. <laughs> and it, I mean, it was it was kind of like one of those things that was just kind of like speculation. And Ryan had his Muay Thai fight, which he won against um, against uh, Jason Klein, mm -hmm. who's a great, who's a great Muay Thai fight. So it's a testament to like 
Ryan because like Jason is like a champion. We got to give a shout out to Ryan yeah, Chester. To give All Ryan's the Chesters, Jeff Chester. They're, they're, we're Sulphur Springs people. We know each other. <laughs> and they're and they're, they're good. They're, people. they're good people. They're good people. <laughs> Hilarious right people. Jeff, if you if you're listening right now. <laughs> Brother, you could be a comedian. Like, he's, <laughs> is he not one of the funniest people you've he, ever met? He really is, but at the same time, it's, it's so sweet. So that's the thing. He's so sweet, but like <laughs> when you speak to him at first, he's so sweet that you don't expect him to be so hilarious. And then he <laughs> says some stuff, and you're just like, "Hey, you know, this guy is absolutely funny." My aunt went to, uh, I believe it was the prom with him, and uh, he dressed as Don Ho. I've heard the story <laughs> so many times, but uh, what a great family! Really a great family. So they had an influence on you, folks like that. Um, and it's kind of crazy that uh, you. I mean, I'm still. I'm. I'm stunned that you just walked right in and got a fight, went in, won it. And I mean, you're just. You're humble. You're happy. <laughs> it's whatever is next for you. It's okay. I, I'm getting that feeling that. I, I'm getting an eye from Corey. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I'm getting that feeling that you know. We never. Know, we don't know what might come from Jason next. I mean, um, I guess at this point it's kind of go with the flow, you know, because if you try and make plans, you know, things just kind of like just happen differently. So it's like, hey, look, you know what? This is happening right now. Kind of go with it. And then whatever happens next, kind of go with that, too. Um, what I, you, what we didn't, I don't know if you guys knew this, but I had a WWE tryout in um, oh, December. Oh, I saw a post about that on uh, your, your Facebook page, mm-hmm. actually. And I was like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Totally, yeah. So how, how's that going? Or what, what's the deal with that? Um, so we had the trial, got flown out to Orlando, Florida for a three day trial, which was probably one of the hardest trials I've ever been really? a, been a part of in my whole entire life. It was just like intense, intense. It, to basically, if you're gonna go for a WWE tryout, and this goes to anybody, make sure your cardio is on point. Like, luckily <laughs> my cardio was on point, so I didn't actually get like absolutely destroyed. But it's no joke, you know, it's, it's really no joke. Um, at this point right now, um, they didn't have like an immediate signing opportunity for me. Um, but they said um, basically just kind of stay in touch, stay updated, just make sure you stay on top of stuff and you never know what can happen in the future. So, so what kind of drills or whatever would they have you do there? Um, is it, I mean, it's with the WWE. Yeah, with wow, the WWE. that is so cool. Mm. Uh, one of my compadres at the, the radio station I work at in Greenville, uh, E-Radio Network, uh, Rob Moore, is, he's a legend of radio in Greenville, but he's also an a announcer for a lot of different wrestling associations. There's actually a pretty strong uh, amateur wrestling and pro wrestling following here in this part of North Texas, which was a surprise to me whenever I first uh, met the man, but... Man, those guys, after talking to him and talking and, and actually taking interest in watching some documentaries like about Andre the Giant or uh, the Ultimate Warrior, like, they're not crazy. They're, they're extremely determined, focused, intelligent, hardworking athletes. Like, they're real athletes. No joke. And, and they are as big as they look. Uh, a couple, several years ago, I got a chance to work uh, backline for a company uh, that did a lot of different shows with concerts, stuff like that. But we got a chance to work a WWE wrestling match, and uh, the Big Show was there. And I remember he walked. He was he was on a cane. He wasn't doing. He had maybe he had surgery. He had a brace on his leg. But there was a woman standing next to him who came up just past his <laughs> belt line, the top of her head, you know. But I can't imagine. Those are the kind of guys like that, you know, uh, kind of filter into that. Especially when you're trying out for stuff. So, did you have to do any kind of, uh, you know, um, hand-to-hand, you know, one-on-one encounters with any of of the guys, or they just wanted to see what you could do physically? Is I mean, like combine. Basically, it was kind of like almost like combine. So you had like the guys who were pro wrestlers, Mm -hmm. and then you had like the guys that came in as athletes, and also girls because there was like women that did the tryout as well, and they had some high-level women wrestlers and some high-level women athletes as well. And um, really, it was kind of like for the athletes, like if we put you through these drills, how well do you, um, how well do you acclimate to them? Like, can you keep up? Can uh-huh. you do like, you know, stuff that we ask you to do? Are you coachable, basically? And for the professional wrestlers, it was almost like, we know you can wrestle, we want to show your ability, but also want to show, are, are you malleable? So like, you know, like, can we, if you have these habits, I would tell you that this is how we do in the WWE, are you able to adapt to that, you know? So it's kind of like, you know, more it was a lot of like physical work but at the same time it's kind of like more mental work really it's like, hey, yeah like you know show us that show us that you know you can do what we ask of you you know when you really think about it what they have to be 
to do that. It's pretty crazy. Like, they're of course they're the, the athlete that that we expect them to be, and they have to be strong and tough and all that stuff. But at the same time, they've really got to be uh, masters of the theatrical stage, you know, because uh, being the hill or being the hero, all these different emotions that they go through and they show, they need to animate towards the audience. Uh, it's got to be hard to do when someone's trying to twist your arm behind your back with a chicken wing or something you know i so i can't imagine but i was just i was hoping to hear that there's an opportunity where someone got to feel your your judo prowess <laughs> uh, which i judo is one of my favorite martial arts i've never been fortunate enough to to learn any of it uh a few weeks ago i got a chance to watch i was wanting to know more about uh, the creation of mma and, and brazilian jiu-jitsu and i know that they derive from judo mm -hmm. uh, but you, you watch a story like R ronda rousey uh, somebody that's totally new to MMA, they come in, they use those skills and uh, and dominate for at least a while until somebody figures out their other dimension. But uh, yeah, judo is pretty pretty gnarly, man. <laughs> it's a great way to end up on the ground with all your air out. <laughs> I mean, it's I think I think um, the one thing about judo which is good is it's it's really about kind of like how do you add your weight to somebody and then take it away. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like really what you're trying to do is you're trying to add your weight to somebody and then subtract it at an instant, and that's when you flip them, you know. So it's like, hey, you know, I'm giving you something, and I'm taking it straight away. So it's almost kind of like, you know, taking candy from a baby. You give candy to a baby, and you take it straight away. And then that's how you – and if you kind of think about judo in that terms, that's how you really become good at it. And I think um, – You set them up just like you do in jiu-jitsu, I guess. Um, kind of like you're, you let them think that they're going to get a – arm bar or a kimura and then the next thing you know i was always the guy on the receiving end of those things <laughs> every time that i've tried to roll somebody. but i think i think we'll see what you find it's crazy is, though it's, it's crazy but it's like think, a chess game it, it really it really is and i think that's where like you know when you get like because we get a lot of guys who start jiu-jitsu uh, or judo and then after a while they kind of like you know leave because they you know just don't feel like they're getting it or they don't feel like they're getting a lot out of it but really, I feel like those people probably haven't grasped the mindset about it. And when I say the mindset, it's not about, like, you have to be tough. You know, you have to, to do this sport. It's like you have to understand that you're going to have to learn a lot through failure. And yeah. in this in, – Because in, you're going to lose a lot when you start. But the thing is <laughs> – Like every time. Yeah, and it's, but the thing is it's like <laughs> – It's fun still, though. It's fun still, but you're, you're not losing when it matters. You know, like yeah. right now you're, you're kind of learning. So, like for me, in my first few weeks doing jiu-jitsu and in my first few, few weeks doing judo, I was getting flipped and I was getting choked out. <laughs> After a while, through that, you kind of learn that, number one, in jiu-jitsu, I just learned I don't like getting choked out. So, I need to figure out, like, how not to get <laughs> choked out. And so, I kind of, like, you know, started, like, when I was rolling and stuff – I started to be more patient and figure out like what was going on. And then more I started to figure out what was going on, I was like, okay, this is what's going on. Maybe this is what I should do to prevent it. And then I started getting good. Like I'm, I'm still a white belt. So I'm mm -hmm. not exactly like, you know, the most experienced guy. Isn't that cool though? Like a white belt in jujitsu, <laughs> his coaches say, Hey, you should fight. And you're like, he's like, okay, you're right. And then he goes into the ring and there's a giant guy there and he beats him. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's pretty freaking awesome. I'm just saying. <laughs> it's pretty cool shit. But who's your biggest inspiration, though? Like, I know you've got to get some kind of positive. I'm all about the law of attraction. I'm all about positive energy. If I don't have positive people around me, it's really hard for me to grow. It's really for, hard for me to build whatever, you know, I'm thinking in my mind at the time. Do you have that, that issue, or are you just your own self-motivation? Do you just use the positive energy to the fullest? Gosh, do I have an inspiration? Uh, I, yeah. I guess, yes. I mean, but the thing is, I think inspiration changes just depending on, like... Some who, people are just self-driven, too, though. I mean, I am... I'm definitely not one of those people. <laughs> I mean, I am self-driven in a way that I always say to myself, if I don't make myself better, no one else can. Mm -hmm. You know, if I don't want it for myself, then I don't want it. And uh, so, you know, I have to make sure that, you know, if, I, if this is something I say I want to do... I have to put 100% of my all into it because I'm a believer. If I'm not putting 100% into something, then I'm wasting my time, you know, because, you know, and that goes for anything. If friendship, if I'm not putting 100% into friendship, then I'm wasting my time. We might as well not be friends no more. You know, if you can't trust me or rely on me to be like 100% your friend, 
then we shouldn't be friends no more. You should be you should be mad at me because at that time I'm not taking our friendship seriously. And it's the same thing with any sport, anything I do, work, you know, graduate school. If I'm not mm-hmm. putting 100% on all into it, then I'm wasting my time, you know. If I'm not trying to get the A, then what am I doing it for, you know? It's- I've got to meet your parents. <laughs> you had to have, like, the most well-rounded parents, right? Or it's- I mean, my my mom who, like, my, I didn't really spend much time with my dad, you know. I kind of lived in a single-parent home. But my mom, um, she always kind of, like, you know, told me, my brother and my sister, you know, all the sacrifices that she's made for us to be successful and she always wanted to understand that you know we could be whatever we wanted to be we just have to like you know number one stay faithful and number two just keep on working hard and mm-hmm. when she said working hard it's not like run yourself down or if you didn't become successful you know you're a failure to people so like, no like if you're gonna do something go at 100 percent. you know don't leave anything on the table because at that point you're doing a disservice to yourself you know you can be anything you want to be if you want to be a uh, cleaner be a cleaner but do it 100 percent. if you yeah. want to go and be uh if you want to go and be a salesman you be a salesman but do it 100 percent. you know like whatever you're going to do make sure that you're putting your full all into it and being the best that you can be at it because people will respect you for it and how many brothers and si- absolutely I, I how many brothers and sisters did you say you had? only one younger brother and an older sister and your and your mother was raising all three kids. So I'm guessing she had to be a worker bee. Oh, yeah, she was. What, what, what did she do? Um, so she was a receptionist. Okay. She was okay. a receptionist. Lots of hours, I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. So that's got to be some kind of inspiration right there. Uh, having a strong, you know, single mom, raising three kids on her own and, and working hard. I'm sure that had to instill some kind of work ethic in you. Um, I mean, probably subconsciously it did. I mean, for me, the main thing was, you know, I didn't want to disappoint my mom because she had put so much into us, like, you know, in terms of sacrifice. I mean, I think the one thing my mom showed me the most is love. You know, I think, you know, it's kind of hard. I think it's easy as a single parent to, you know, probably be very selfish and kind of think to yourself, I'm doing it by myself. But my mom always put us first. You know, she it was like always about us. Yeah. I mean, she didn't date anybody while we were born. Really? You know, she was just always just a single parent because she said that we always came first. Wow. And so for us, it was just kind of like, you know, a lot of it was if somebody's put that much effort into us and invested that much time into us, we have to kind of have some ROI, return on investment. Man, you know, there's not a lot of women like that. I've I've known one my entire life. My great grandmother, Ma, she uh, passed away 20 years my ago now. Thank you, but she, uh, my great grandfather passed away when my grandmother was just seven years old, and uh, she had two older brothers, and uh, so it's three kids and her, and they lived in, they started in California, and that's where he passed away at, and so they had to move to Arkansas, where cost of living was cheaper, and she was a nurse, but. Uh, Talk about a strong woman. She never married. She never dated. Uh, the day that she passed away, she was single. You know, she was always like, I guess, like your mother. She was more married to her children. Yeah. Uh, and, and the the dedication of uh, raising them and being there for them, and I just always was in awe. You know, like, wow. How 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 do you make it through alone? How do you do that? You know. I mean, I guess when you when you kind of give yourself purpose, you know, when you kind of put like when you um, when you put others first, you know, you're kind of selfless. I guess it gives you more purpose because it's like, you know, I've, I'm doing it for, like, everything I do, there's somebody who benefits from it. And, you know, I guess that probably is, like, you know, a lot of probably what I put into, you know, my my life in terms of just the way I kind of carry myself. It's like, you know, my mom directly benefits, my family directly benefits, and also, you know, at the end of the day, anybody who comes after me, like, if I speak to kids, if I speak to somebody else, how can I tell them to do something if I'm not believing in it myself or I, if I'm practicing what I preach? So if I'm telling them, you have to mm-hmm. go 100%, it's if I'm not doing 100% too, I'm, I'm a hypocrite, you know? That's true. That is true. Do you think you could do it yourself if you were in, in your mother's position? Yeah, I think for sure. You like, think you know, so? I mean, I, it's not easy, you know, but I'll find a way. I mean, one of my coaches, one of my favorite coaches, Coach um, Coach Kaz Gazzotti, who was at Baylor, uh-huh. I mean, he always had a phrase where he said that, you know, I mean, and this can apply to anybody i don't want it to be sexist but he used to say well, obviously we're an all-male football team so right he used to say um boys do what they want to do and men do what they have to do okay and it's, it's it's saying that you know especially when you relate to football like we have to wake up at 6 a.m we have to you know do stuff at times that we don't want to do like you know you've got that. a routine you've got a routine and a boy would break the routine because they want to do what they want to do like yeah you know, so for instance they know that, okay, we've got a 6 a.m. workout, but they might stay up past 12 a.m. and then maybe miss the workout because they couldn't wake up on time. 
and he would say if you're a man you would understand that maybe i might need to put myself second and kind of like maybe go to bed earlier <laughs> because i know i have to be up at 6 a.m and do stuff that i wanted to do and the thing is it's like when you kind of think to yourself it's like especially game day i can't choose when game day is the league has set that rule so like mm-hmm. at the end of the day i have to be no matter what t- that they told us you have to be prepared at 6 a.m to play a game if i decided that that's what I have to do to be successful, then I need to be ready at 6 a.m. So I, I can't pick and choose when to be, you know, when to be relevant or when to be present. I have to be present at all times. And I think when you've got kids and so forth in the equation, you have to understand that, like, you know, for them, I can't I can't say to them, hey, because daddy didn't want to take this certain job, like, you're going to go hungry for a week because kids ain't going to understand. They're going to be like, well, you know what, um, where's the cereal on the table you know yeah and so for me it might mean that i might have to take a job that i don't want to do just to make sure that you know that i'm providing for my kids it might mean that you know there might be a job out there and i don't want to mention jobs because i don't want to belittle anybody because i feel like every job is important if you work in a job and you're employed you're doing a good job you know you're important you're, you're, you're putting money on the table you're right put, you're, putting you're money contributing in your you're contributing so any job that you anybody has is relevant but at the same time you know there's some people that might have feel like they're spoiling their pride to do certain occupations but if you're if you've if you're kind of like somebody who's dutiful and also somebody who's selfless then it's not really breaking your pride it's i'm doing whatever i can to be to make sure that you know the people who i'm around can survive and number two i'm making sure i'm doing whatever i can to put money on the table so then that way we can you know live a fulfilling life you know i always think and, and you hear this too uh i couldn't do it women are mothers are superhumans and they are they are strong uh, but the thing is is there's different kinds of people uh there's so i did a little time in the service and as far as i'll go into that uh but there's a structured environment there you have to be at a certain place you have certain times and certain expectations dress codes all that stuff for someone like me i didn't know it then but looking back in the rear view that is something that i really appreciated something that kept me in line kept me going kept me on the schedule um because I didn't have a whole lot of self-discipline. Whereas someone like you, I think it wasn't that probably as much of a big deal as just what you did, just what you do, right? And I mean, I think... It, because I have a feeling you're the guy at at three in the morning whenever all the guys are out on the balcony doing shots in the dorm. You're like somebody's knocking on your door, and you're like, "Guys, can y'all just keep it down? I've got to be up at six in the morning." I probably I, I, no. I probably might not be that guy that's like <laughs> telling to keep it down because trust me, when I want to sleep, I'm dead. To oh, the you're world. out. I'm out. To, I'm out. But I probably would be the guy, and you know, it's you know, if people are hearing this um, or listen to this, and you're my friends, you know. I kind of like the fact that I get to say this, like, you know, I wasn't putting you guys on the back burner. Mm-hmm. It's just I had goals, you know? And so yeah. like, anytime I would be like, you know, I can't do this or I can't come out or I can't do this, people would think I'm, you know, sh- shifting them or shafting them because they, they thought I didn't like them no more. But it's, I understood what, to get where I needed to be, what I had to put in. And so it wasn't ever like, you know, I'm trying to like, you know, kind of put you to the side. It was always about like, if I need to get where I want to be, I know that, I know where I'm at. And if I'm not where I'm at or where I need to be, then I need to put in more work to get there. And so, um, it's self discipline. It's self. It's self discipline, and at the same time, it's hard because you know that, for instance, like there's some probably some bridges that I didn't exactly burn, but the bridge between me and my friends, it might not be as tight as it was, and it's and it, and it, sometimes I feel guilty for that because it feels like you know maybe I might have put my i might put my occupation before friendship and it might seem that way to me it wasn't that way because it was it was never a case of occupation or friendship it was a case of occupation with friendship mm-hmm. so if you understood what i was doing then you would understand that hey like we are we are still tight if you need me for anything i'm always there for you but in terms of like maybe sometimes going out or doing that stuff i might not be there for you then because it's just i've got this to do i've got this to handle you know and i felt bad i, I still feel bad to this day well you shouldn't because i think people a lot of times have a tendency to make it about them you know like you you know tonight you had a little longer training than normal i could have been like well fuck him he don't want to <laughs> care he's blowing me off you know i could have made it like that but in reality the the attitude we had is and he's training, man. Those guys go hard. You know, they're not messing around. When they want to train, there's people there to do it. They're going to do it. 
Uh, and sure enough, that's that's just the vibe that, that you get from some people if you pay attention. I can tell you're a self-disciplined guy. Uh, so with stuff like that, I think if, if folks, if your friends are listening, uh, just, you know, kind of step back a little bit and try to look at the at the grand scheme of things. You know, if someone is your friend and you really believe they're a genuine person, like you said, when you need them, they will be there, mm-hmm. you know. And, and if they have something else going on, uh, that's okay. Let them live their life. It doesn't all have to be about you. You know? And that's what you know, and and that's what I was kind of like thinking at first. Then I kind of put myself in in people's shoes, and I was like, you know, sometimes I can I can understand where they're coming from, or mm-hmm. like if if they feel that way, I can understand it too. But at the same time, it's like you know, the path to especially like the paths that I'm going down and the the opportunities I've got, those are really narrow paths. You know, not many people can do those kind of things. And yeah. if you're one of those people that want us to do those kind of things, you have to understand that there are certain ways to get there and there's certain ways to fall off. And if I fall off right now, again, it's going to bring a lot of what if questions like, you know, like what if I had done this instead of doing this? And I don't think I'm at the point in my life where I can necessarily say, hey, I can put this off to do this. I have to find out right now. And at the same time, like, you know, I'm always empathetic and always saying, like, my, and I tell people this all the time, my door is never closed. If you need me, just just holler at me and I'll always be there. Like, you know, I might, will I have all the answers? Maybe not. But, like, you know, I might have an answer for you. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But the thing is... Closed mouth does not get fed. Closed mouth does not get fed. And that's where I try to make, make people understand that, you know, just because I'm off being busy doesn't mean I'm blowing you off. It just means I'm off being busy. But trust me if you need me for anything i will always be there for you you know and especially like i know i mean getting ready for a 16 week camp because my day is pretty much spent like you know i'm at work and work in the morning do some homework you know and then i'm training pretty much like from the day onwards like you know going so on. are you training for a fight right now no right now i'm not training for a fight i'm getting brian ready for his fight okay okay um we'll find out if i have a fight or anything soon but like i'm just kind of like you know i'm just making sure i stay fresh stay i'm so day. excited for that guy i mean to get I'm back in the too. ring again man he's I'm, such a good guy he's such a good guy and he's and, he, and he's kung fu panda like, He'll surprise you, man. Like, I've watched him. You know, he does a lot of. He does more. The days that I've been there for jujitsu, he's usually doing the kickboxing day that day. We just it, it happened that I haven't been in a while. I'm recovering, <laughs> Shane. <laughs> but uh, man, I want to see him do well. You I, know, I anybody think, that knows him, you 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 want that guy to do well, and and I think that he will because he's got the attitude. He's got the positive energy going. You and know? he's uh, he's a hard worker. He's a hard hitter. I think um, having him in my camp um, definitely helped me to get ready for my fight. So having guys who experience like that, he's ranked num- I think he's number three or five in Texas. Really? And so he's uh, you know he's no joke. Ryan is a good fighter, and so I mean I, I'm I'm blessed to have like guys like that high level guys that get to train with, and I'm I'm pretty sure he's gonna do well no matter what opponent he has in the mm-hmm. fight. And and I and I hope that he does. I know that he will, though. Oh, yeah, I know no, that he will. Sure. We're all we're all uh, rooting for Ryan Chester oh, out there. Yeah. Does he have a date already for his April twenty seventh? April twenty seventh. Uh, Texas Live. Texas Live. Mm-hmm. So mark your calendars down. We're gonna have to make a trip out there. Mm-hmm. Go see Ryan. So you're training constantly though, mm-hmm. which keeps you in in good shape. But it keeps you it keeps you going. And you're also you're you're finishing up your degree, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, which is in um, English with a certificate in computational linguistics. English with a certificate in computational mm-hmm. linguistics. Mm-hmm. Did I say that right? Mm-hmm. Wow, I, you know, I don't know what it is, but I know I'm definitely not smart enough to enroll in it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, it's basic computer science um, combined with linguistics. So um, the basic way that I kind of tell people that it works is almost like Google mm-hmm. it's basically like text recognition and so forth is a lot of what computational linguistics kind of um, leads to and so it's not as complex I mean I'm not going to bore people and go through the actual logistics of how everything works but if people ask what computational linguistics is it's search engines is a uh, it's pretty much that, like text recognition, search engines, okay, all that kind of stuff. That's computation linguistics. Okay, okay. So it's more how they work, not necessarily that they exist. Oh, exactly. Now, now we're tickling uh, Corey's fancy bone <laughs> over here. He, he is our uh, 
honorary techie of American <laughs> Inc. Really, he's the he's the motor that drives this thing. But uh, he thank could, you, thank you. He could probably relate and understand more of the words that are coming out of your mouth than I can. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'm really intrigued about the the education you received in England. Uh, you were telling me about the different levels of school that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just junior high, high school, and then college. Mm -hmm. There, it seems like the, do they prepare you more for college? Is that um, how it works, or I'm just curious. I Isn't think there one less year before you go to university. No, I, actually, technically, it's the same. So, like, you go into university here at like 18 and so forth. Mm -hmm. You go into university in England at 18 as well. It's one year. It's actually one less year in school. So you have four year universities, but really in in England, you can complete university in three. So ah. it's like um. So you find people coming out at 21 because like um. The differences between American college and English and English um, universities, I uh, feel like, not even that. It's just the actually no, that's a big one. But <laughs> <laughs> which is more expensive? Um, definitely here. <laughs> definitely here. This so is, that's the reason why they have the fourth year, so they get a whole another year of charging your ass. English yeah. is catching up. <laughs> Eng yeah, England's catching up. Like you know, the pr the price the price is still relatively cheaper than um, than America, but um, it's 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 definitely. It's exponentially grown over the years, but the one other difference is um, the fact that when you go to England and you start university, you're already starting in your major, so you don't declare like you like you have to go in. So if you say you're going to be a computer science major, you have to know that from year one. Wow! And so you've had this plan for a while. Exactly. Oh wow! Exactly. So like your classes in sixth form college will be the classes that are gearing you towards whatever you're going to do in university. But you know what? I feel like that might actually simplify it for a kid going into college. You know, you think you're in a class. I, I've had this problem. I'm a business management major, dropout. Um, I started college, you know, I, I work, after working in a certain career field uh, to get a little more security in that career field. Uh, during the process, I learned that I had another skill set, uh, and I went in that direction uh, you know, professionally, while still getting an education in business management. At some point, I was—I got to the point where I'm like, well, maybe I need to be in uh, radio, television. Maybe I need to be in business management. I couldn't decide, and what happened eventually, I felt like the all the analytics and all the numbers cl classes that you have to take for business management were too much, and I just dropped out. And I don't know. Maybe if you're already told or you make the decision, this is what I've got. This is what I'm going to stick with. Maybe it's a little easier to stay on on the track. I don't know. I mean, I feel like. Or do you feel like it's opposite? No. Nah, here's my belief, and I I hate saying this because I don't want to. Because I'm a. Be honest. Be honest. I, I'm, and, Please. I'm gonna be very. I'm gonna be very honest because this is this is what I this is what I personally believe. This is a worldly view, honestly. This is someone that has been educated and raised as an adult to an adult age, uh, in another part of the country, and it's a fascinating thing for me to hear your perspective. And I think a lot of the, the listeners out there are the same. So don't hold back, please, Jason. <laughs> All right, well, in saying that right, let me t let me put it this way. I don't believe you need a degree to tell you you're smart. I also don't think a degree necessarily is an indicator of how well you're going to be prepared for the workforce. Because mm -hmm. let's put it this way, right? If, especially, all right, let's take it from, from computer science kind of view. You could learn about computers all throughout college, and then you get to a job, and you realize that I might, you know a lot, but you don't know how to apply a lot. Oh, yeah. And I think that's where people kind of like, um, so for me personally as a computer scientist, I would say I don't necessarily need a degree to be a good computer scientist. All I need to do is be good at learning computer science to be a scientist. The only thing, the only reason why people need a degree nowadays is because it simplifies the choosing process. So it's like, for instance, if I have a degree and I'm trying to compete with other people that don't have a degree, like, you know, so recruiters looking at me, it's easy to say no to the person who doesn't have a degree and simplify the amount people have to look through. So I don't have to look through 3,000 applications. It's, there's this... Um, Elimination process. Exactly. It's and like it, a litmus test because you actually got up every day and went to class and passed class and paid for it. And so you're interested enough to follow through that. So they know that you're ready to show up and do work. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Well, I've been fortunate to get the jobs that I've gotten. I, I did do some time in the military, and I did get my uh, a aviation uh, airframe and power plant license to work on aircraft, which I don't do anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess that would that would help, obviously, with my honorable discharge from the military. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess when you do look at someone that has a, a degree, 
myself, I mean, it, there is a certain level of accomplishment that you you acknowledge. You say, okay, you're dedicated, you're determined, you're self-disciplined enough to get you through this four years or however long to achieve that point. So I could say, yeah, as an employer, you're looking for qualified, driven, hardworking people. Uh, obviously, the first place you want to look is for graduates, right? Mm-hmm. And I got lucky where I didn't pay for school. So, oh, yeah. you know, it's for me, like, that was a no-brainer where it was like, the system, all right, and this is where I'm going to say, like, you know, I'm going to say in the nicest way possible, the system was using me, mm-hmm. but I had to use the system as well. Right. So it's like, I know, like, I was I was needed to play football and, like, you know, help a team win, practices and so forth. But at the same time, it's like, well, if I'm getting this great opportunity, why not make, why not use it to the best of my ability and get an education, you know? <laughs> have something to show. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, if, 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 you're, if, I'm, if you're getting something out of me, I'm going to get something out of you. So it's like, you know, why not just get me a degree? And But if I had to pay for it out of pocket, would I be in college? I don't know. Like, you know, I, I don't necessarily feel like I need to be in college to, like, necessarily get a degree. And that's not trying to, like, belittle anybody who's gone to college, got a degree, or is working on a degree right now. I'm not telling you to drop out right now and so forth. <laughs> I believe that there is value in going to college. And I believe there's more value from the fact that you get a lot of social interaction. The relationships. Exactly. The networking. Exactly. Yeah. Because you'll find even when you get out of here, like, you know, a lot of the jobs that I got wasn't so much because of what I know. It's because I knew what I know and I was talking to somebody who was able to help me get to a certain place. So if anything, I feel like networking is probably the biggest. Um, Absolutely. I, everything I do today, everything. This guy's sitting over here, met him at college. <laughs> you know, I started playing and singing uh, on the weekends uh, from a guy I met in college. Everything that that I, that you, that I've got in my life right now. Of course, I had a major career change at thirty. Mm-hmm. I think I tell everyone I had a pre midlife crisis. Uh, <laughs> I hope it's pre mature, uh, but um, it's it. That's what college is all about, and especially here in the United States, because it seems like, I, you know, I'm not from another country originally, so I can say this with comfort. It seems like a lot of the universities are more focused on profit than they are actually educating their students. And I think that's true. I think it's like, you know, especially when you look at the astronomical prices that, you know, universities charge for students to go to, you know, to go to study and so forth. You kind of look at you like, okay, cool. So I'm going to leave this school with a lot of debt. Mm -hmm. And I don't exactly know how I'm going to exactly pay it back when I leave. I'm going to get a job, which is probably like, you know, like if you say, for instance, you leave and you get a job, that's like 50K or something like that. Yo, that salary, you owe some of that to the government already. Right. And, you know, it's, 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 and, and again, it's not trying to, because I understand like degrees help you get jobs, which is, I mean, which is a fact that we have to accept. Right. My thing is to people is that I feel like some people feel they put a lot of pressure on themselves to go to college and graduate and be so forth. But for some people, I'm like, hey, look, you need to understand that, you know, there is other pathways in life to success. You don't necessarily need to go and like, you know, if, if college isn't you, you don't need to necessarily be in college because at the end of the day, that's going to probably stress you out a lot. You're, not, you're probably going to not succeed. Some people don't. I mean, it just doesn't work for them. Some it people, it's uh, they're Some people are just flat out introverts, exactly. you know, and it doesn't work for them. But I think that's a pretty small degree for the most part. I think college is worth I know it's a lot to ask for in this country, uh, but also our expectations are really high as as Americans, as kids, as adolescents growing up. We expect to go to that big university. We expect to have the convertible on graduation. We expect so much. We feel so much entitlement at an early age that uh, a lot of times we make things harder on ourselves. Uh, like, I mean, we see this all the time. Kids that get out of high school and they didn't have the greatest grades, they didn't have any special talent or athletic ability, but they are determined to go to the big Division One college. See. And a lot of times, I've seen this, I, we've had some great athletes here from Sulphur Springs that wind up at, you know, at Florida State or, or Notre Dame or wherever, and I'm not saying anywhere particular because I don't have anywhere in mind, but a year later they're back home while everybody else is playing football. Um, and I think it's just because some environments don't match some personalities and instead of people trying to tackle mount everest at at once sometimes you just got to step back and kind of take the molehill and i think you know in you saying that it kind of like triggered me because it's like when you kind of think about it who's everybody trying to impress like who are you really trying to impress? Exactly. Are you trying to impress who, like if you're not trying to impress yourself it is their self. It's their own ego. It's. I mean, but the thing is, it's like for me, like it's our own ego because I have one. You know. I mean, everybody, <laughs> everybody has an ego. I mean, 
and I feel like sometimes, especially with this something that you're kind of like, you know, interested in and you find out that you're not as good at it as you're supposed to, mm-hmm. it can deflate you. The the stance that I take is if I'm not good at something, I'm going to, I'm going to be good at it at yeah. some point, you know? So it's like, okay, I wasn't good at it right now, but I need to learn why I'm not good at it. And like, I need to find a way to get good at it. You know? Do you golf? Um, no. I'm, <laughs> I definitely, don't, okay. I'm definitely not good at golf. I'm in that boat <laughs> with you. It's one of those things, like I played it a couple times and I, and I'm like that. If I'm, if I'm interested in something and I want to be good, <laughs> I will not stop until I am. Yeah. Um, but Golf is one of those things like it was hard and I wasn't very good at it, but I could is every time I hit the ball, I could feel this competitive like, oh, it's going to go straight. It's going to go further. And I've done some charity golf tournaments and stuff like that. And I can see the addiction. Sometimes you can see the dragon, you know, you can see the, the tunnel that you're about to go down. And I'm immediately I'm just like, OK, this is not a habit or a hobby that I need to get in tight because all my money, all my time would be invested in that hobby, you know. And I used to feel that way about uh, MMA before, you know, coming bringing my son to Ion Jiu Jitsu and meeting Shane and everything like that. And uh, I'm I'm almost ready to go back. I've still got this little little lung yeah, issue. Yeah, listen, get, get yourself. But uh, yeah. man, you talk about a, a great experience. It, I encourage anybody. And we were talking about college. Of course, you want to attempt go to college, but anything really. Uh, for me, I, I've always wanted to learn uh, martial arts and jujitsu and grappling techniques and things like that. It's fun to test yourself against a, a, an, another human. Uh, whenever we would roll, you know, it, it was intimidating, of course, because you're a strong guy. <laughs> you know that you're strong. Um, but it was fun. It is fun, you know. And if there's anything in life that, that excites you, that interests you, that just makes you curious for even a second, I say go ahead first. That's And that's the thing. Like, it's like, I mean – I feel like even when I put it, even when even when I put it into sporting terms, um, when you're a sports person, you you risk a lot. You know, yeah. you risk a lo- you risk losing. You know, and it's that's that's the that's you risk injury, you risk losing. You know, there's a lot of risk involved. But if you're afraid to put that on the line, then you don't deserve to be in sports. You don't deserve to be in life because at the end of the day, I mean, that's why gambling is such an addiction because it's like. You risk every, and that's why for me gamblers don't make sense to me sometimes. If you're a gambler, but you're not a gambler in life, then it doesn't make sense because it's like you know if you're not willing to gamble in yourself and your success, where failure fail is where failure is an option, but the immediate failure of losing your money, but you want to, but you still got the addiction to for the instant gratification, then that is kind of backwards to me because it's like that effort should be put into the same thing in life. Like if you if you've got a passion in life. Why not put that, you know, that kind of risk into 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 that, you know? Because it's like you don't know where it's gonna go. You don't know where it's gonna go, you know. And it's and that's where it's, it's like, you know, like if I if it's jujitsu, I risk getting choked out. But the fact is, I can't know until I try, you know. So I have to go in there and you know go and try at least, you know. Find but have it. you actually ever been choked out? Um, yeah, Shane actually like nearly put me to sleep. Right? Really, in a bone flu <laughs> choke, like you know, it was it was a choke where that guy, man, he's so flexible and he's what is he forty? I don't know how old he is. 50. He's fifty. He's okay. fifty. Okay, but still, he's in amazing shape. He's somebody I'd, I'd love to get in here sometime. We, we were talking earlier. He is our hometown Chuck Norris, mm-hmm. right? I mean, he's calm, he's cool, he's collected, well, he but he knows how to you. handle his I'll, business. He will choke you. Like <laughs> that's how I learned how to get so good. Some well, not so good, but like that's how I learned to get better. Because I say again, when you're in Iowa in Jiu Jitsu, um, we don't baby people in there. No, they don't. Throw you to the fire. <laughs> so, my son, he lives in North Richland Hills with his mother, and he also trains at the UFC gym over there, where Deshai trains at. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's a totally different animal when it comes to Ion. And these kids are so advanced, they're so strong, they're so skilled. Uh, their technical abilities are just mind blowing. And he goes three times a week over there. But whenever he comes over here to Ion, it's just like overwhelming, you know, because they really do. I, Alan, for example, I, I've seen you and Alan roll a couple times, and Alan is probably three or four inches shorter than I am, uh, and he's in good shape, but he's not, you know, sculpted out of granite like like <laughs> some of these people we see over here across the table. But I've seen him throw you around a couple times too. <laughs> hey, I mean, to be fair, like, and that's where he's a strong dude. He's a strong dude, and I think, um, I think, the one thing about um, jiu-jitsu and MMA is I feel like a lot of people have to throw their pride out the window. Like, you know, like where somebody like Alan, you know, beating up on me, 
it could be easy for me to be like, man, like, you know, a little dude is beating up me. Like, you know, this is not good. It's not good. Look, but it's like, look, you know, I don't care. You know, am I getting better? Like, yeah. it's not about, it's not about how it looks. It's about what am I getting out of it? And I think, you know, going against guys like that is what got me good. And it's what makes me unafraid, you know? And so it's like, you know, at that point, it's like, look, I'm, I'm getting high level trainings from high level guys. You know, I'm, well, I'm going to embrace that, you know, it's like, it's about the knowledge and where I'm going to just take that pride at the window. It doesn't matter if I'm a big guy or I'm beginning this guy. On a good day, if you've got more skill than I have, and they've got lots of knowledge, mm -hmm. the black belts, you know, like, oh, what, what do I expect? The black belts are my white belt. Of course I'm going to get choked out, you know, that's, that's <laughs> something that I understand. Like, you know, they're, they're high level grapplers, been doing it for a, a long time. And so what do I have to do? I have to learn to, you know, I have to learn from them, you know, and I have to change my mentality from, I have to beat these guys to what am I getting out of it? Like when I leave here, what did I learn today? And this could be something little as like, I learned how to escape. I learned like, you know, this choke. I learned this, like I learned these things right now. Like it's those little small victories because small victories will compound into a big thing as opposed to like, oh yeah, like, you know, I choked out Shane or I choked out Alan, which has <laughs> never happened. And probably might never happen. Like, you know, but it's at the same time, instead of going for that, it's like, no, like let me learn little things that will get me better because the more little things that I learned that will get me better when I go against somebody who's in my same skill range, mm -hmm. I'm probably going to be high level. Right. You bring it up a notch. Exactly. Man, but but really, though, like, I know they're the nicest, most humble guys. They are. They're the sweetest guys. They would literally do anything for for anybody that they, you know, was in their circle. Um, you don't want to run into them on the dark alley. Nah. You don't want to get on their bad side. You don't want to run into them in, you don't <laughs> run into them in plain sight on a, on a sunny day. Trust me. <laughs> Uh, much like yourself, uh, but I gotta ask you: uh, Do you could you ever see yourself going professional in this sport? Yeah, I mean, I feel like um, that's probably the goal. You know, just to kind of get more experience under my belt, and then um, go into the realms of the professional, the professional scene, and then um, to see how it goes from there. So, um, in terms of, I know people kind of like you know come like, yeah, I'm the best, like you know this and that. For me, it's not about that. It's about like one step at a time, focus on the next. Enjoying the journey. Enjoying the journey and just knowing that the next opponent is the most dangerous opponent. You know, mm -hmm. like instead of focusing about like, I want to go for the biggest top dog. It's like, no, you have to respect the game, respect the, respect the craft. So for me, it's like the next opponent I have, I don't know who he is yet, but that's the most dangerous person I have to face because that's the next person up. And so I'm going to train for them like they're like a high level person because at the end of the day, I want to show respect. When it, when when you face me, I want to be the best Jason Ose that you're facing. You know, I want you to understand that I respect you enough to be at my tip top shape to give you everything I have. Like you're going to get, you're going to get 100 percent, you know, you're not going to get 50 or 90 percent. I'm not going to come in and think to yourself, oh, yeah, this, this guy isn't as good as me. No, you're going to get 100 percent. Like, you know, if you're not ready, that's on you. You need shame <laughs> on you. Because you know, I'm going to be ready. I'm going to be ready, you know. So it's, <laughs> and that's, a, it's a that's the discipline. That's the discipline, you know. It's like shame on you. Like, you know, if you lost because you're not ready, that's on you. You need to, to make sure that you're ready at all times. Always be ready. Mm -hmm. But for me, as I said, again, I'm going to make sure that, again, you know, wherever, wherever I am, it's going to be 100 percent. And that's even when going pro or like, you know, whatever the next step is after that, I'm going to make sure that um, I'm going to make sure that I am a hundred percent. And like, you know, just as they giving it my best, giving me my all. Sorry. I got to make it look like we just, we didn't cut. <laughs> well, you know, I'm when we get good at this, we'll just do it all live. But, yeah, which, is, which makes sense. But like, I'm not good at it right now. <laughs> hey, Joe Rogan's had people go to the bathroom on his podcast before. Yeah, but Joe Rogan's a badass, and he's been a comedian and all kinds of stuff that I'm not anything. <laughs> he's a black belt and what taekwondo and I'm I think he's like a purple belt in jujitsu. Yeah, like he's like he's pretty much he's like a he's a bad motherfucker. Like really, he's, he, he's one belt. <laughs> really, he is one belt should have been in Dragon Ball Z or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He's a badass, for real man. Uh, when you get a chance, Luke, also drop your mic down a little bit. It's not up in your grill. Well, I'm ugly. Shit, I want it there. Uh, well, n you you look all bug-eyed with age that. <laughs> and my double chin and all that shit. You know, uh, I think <laughs> Luke, I think you are exaggerating because like you. I'm know, dramatic. Yeah, because I was gonna say, as I said again, until you told me you're 37, like I honest to God didn't even think <laughs> well, thank you were like, you, in 30. So like. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're good. Real, thanks, man. <laughs> so did did the guy that you just fought? Uh, did he get a hundred percent of Jason? Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, because you look kind of scared there, bro. You said I look kind of scared. <laughs> I'm just I mean, joking. No, no, so no, that is you, that is probably like an accurate 
That's fine. You're probably if scared scared as in you're scared of probably overexerting. No, like I'm going into a cage to fight another guy. Like it's terrifying. Well, and he's taller than you by a lot too, but right? Even still, like it's like roll it when you're when you're going in to um, roll it. when you're going into fight. You're going like when my music started playing, right? It's like. Wow, this is actually him. I'm actually gonna go fight another man, <laughs> and then you you go into the actual cage. The cage door closes, and you're like, "Hold on a second, I'm really gonna fight another guy." <laughs> you're standing across the ring, ring from him, like you know, looking him in the eye and so forth. You know, you can't look down because once you kind of like you know look down or look away, it's it's almost like uh, it's almost like you kind of conceded the fight. But you have to kind of think to yourself, like, "Wait, hold on a second. This like I'm in a cage. Like, there's no escape." <laughs> The only people in here are me, my opponent, the referee, maybe got my corner right here saying stuff to me. So it's kind of like you got someone like with you, like a team effort. But really, it's all eyes on you. You're in here. The only way to get out of here is to win or lose. You know? Oh, man. And so it's like, it's, it's terrifying. You know what I mean? Don't let it, don't let it get <laughs> twisted. Going to fight somebody, like, you know, going to like physically beat somebody up and know that you're going to get beaten up too. It's terrifying. Like it's it's it, it, it's fighting. No lie. When I think about it, actually, if you were to, I mean, anybody that goes into any kind of martial arts, right? You you do it for a reason. Uh, most of us guys, we're macho. We want to test our metal, or some of us like to fight. Some of us like all that kind of stuff. You start kind of, I don't know if you would say fantasizing, but you kind of start playing out what it would be like in your head. And you get all these ideas, you know, well, what would it be like I, if I was to get in shape? And what would I look like? And what weight class would I cut down to? And all this stuff. And then you eventually you always roll around to thinking, what's it going to be like to walk through that door and have someone across look at me and, and know they are trying to do bodily damage to me. They're trying to harm me. They're going to ring the bell and they're going to throw everything at me that they have. Uh, and the, the sensation that's always there is fear. For me, at least. No, what's I mean? It's, and I'm somebody that's really excited about the whole uh, the competitive aspect and, and testing your metal. I, I, I have an ego, you know. Um, I, I love the competition. And, and whenever, like when we roll in jujitsu, and I know I'm going to get my ass kicked, I'm so excited. Everything that, that my opponent does – Wow, that's so cool. That's thank you. You know, I'm super excited. But you think about the point where someone's going to put hands on you. They're going to hit you with their knuckles and their fists. Yeah, fear is it's there, right? It, I mean, it's it's ever present. Like you know, if, if you're not scared, you either really experienced, you're really crazy. And that's the way I can put it. You know, I mean, everybody's different. For me, I feel like the fear and the nervousness shows I care about something. Mm-hmm. So I know if I'm if I'm scared and I'm nervous, I know that I care about it enough where I'm gonna go 100 percent because that way I know that the, me going 100 percent is my protection. You know if I don't go 100 percent, then I'm definitely in trouble. That means that you know I'm I'm, I'm at risk of getting hurt because you know if somebody else is giving like more than I'm giving, then at some point you know I'm gonna get broken down. But if I'm giving as much or more than they're giving, then I know that at least it's protecting myself. That means I'm not at risk of getting hurt. But in the caveat to that is I don't know how much they're giving, so I can't right. really I can't really gauge and say yeah like you know I'm giving 100 percent they're giving 80. So like you know like maybe they can taper. Are up. they like, pacing themselves? Yeah, no. It's like no. At that point, whatever they're doing is whatever they're doing. I it's a fight, man. It's like a fight, you know, <laughs> I hear you know you think about it and you, and you watch people's fights and you try to critique for you know from a fan you know totally mm-hmm. amateur opinion. Um, but you're like you're, you're thinking, okay, they gotta pace themselves, and they blew their wide, and and by the way, that's not a, a sexual innuendo. That's a reference <laughs> to uh, uh, black powder rifles and and loading your musket. Just to clarify, my mind's not in the gutter. <laughs> but um, in reality, you're going 100 percent the whole time because you're trying not to get your block knocked off. Am I am I right? No, it's true. I mean, it's like you know. You're doing as so. Think about it right now. I'm attacking and defending in the same breath. That takes a lot of energy. You know, it's like you're mm-hmm. gonna get tired. It's, that's a that's a complete fact. I mean, people should know. It's just people, like when you roll. Yeah, just like when you roll. You're defending. You're attacking at the same time. It's it's energy expansion. You know, it's not it's not something that you can do a hundred percent and not get tired. If you if you can do that, you're you're either Superman or you're just not from this world. Like you know, I'll, I'm not commended <laughs> for that. 
if you do, if you get tired and you, you're a human being, that's just what happens. Like, you know, we've got limitations. Some people just got better limitations than others. And, you know, when you're exerting that much energy to try and prevent something from happening, as well as trying to make something happening, you're going to get tired, you know? It's just, and when you're doing that 100%, it's easy to get tired, you know? Like, you know, I got tired during the fight, you know? That's Did cool. you? I mean, yeah. What round do you think you got was like, you're like, okay, I've got to breathe slower. I, I mean, what round did it kind of hit you where you're like, I'm getting tired? I think Shit. probably midway through round three. I mean, I had an adrenaline dump pretty early where, you know, in the first round I, I, I dumped. I had an adrenaline dump. I mean, it's naturally going to happen. This first fight, you know, nerves. Didn't know what to oh, expect. Yeah. Didn't know what it was going to go. It was both y'all's first fight, right? It was. I think he had. I'm I, I like to say he had like two fights. Before. Okay. I don't know what kind of fights they were, but um, I think it was just like his MMA debut or like his KO debut. But I know he had like two fights before because he came in with a two and zero record. Really. And then um and then I, everybody's got to lose sometime. I, well, I mean, as I said again, it could have been me. You know, like he was a good opponent. Credit to him. Like, but know, we all knew it wasn't going to be you, though, Jason. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> as I said, when you get to the heavyweight, when you get to heavyweight. All it takes is one punch, then it can That's turn the tide of a fight, you know. So, you know, even though we had we went the full distance, you know, I probably had a few opportunities to um, to win before that. Um, and he probably like you know, if I mean, if he connects with the right punch, he had opportunities to win before that too. You know, it's, it's one of those things where heavyweight is never ever set in stone. It could just all it takes is one, and the, it could be a turning point in the fight. Um, but at the same time, it was like. Um, you know, after that adrenaline dump, it was like, you know, you just kind of feel like everything just kind of leaves your body and you're just like, kind of, you feel, you feel kind of bare. Like, it's like, right now, like, you know, I'm gassed, but I'm not gassed, but, you know, I'm trying to, like, hold it in there. But at that point, it's like, you know, I have to just kind of rely on my reserve energy and try and get through the fight. And it was when I got to midway through the third round where I was, like, completely kind of like, yeah, like, if this went another round, I don't know, like, you know, how my gas tank would do. I mean, I'll do as much as I could, but that's probably me at that point, just kind of like knowing it's the third round, it's the last round. So you, you get that kind of finish line fatigue. Mm -hmm. But, you know, probably if it went like another round so far, I probably might have been okay. Um, Is a fight out there where folks can see it now? Yeah, so if you Google my name, or if, if you even Google the shy's name, it will, it will come up. And that's Jason Osei, O-S-E-I. Yes. That's a lot easier to spell than uh, Deshaun... <laughs> Is that his name? The Shy Finzen. The Shy Finzen. Yeah. Uh, he's got a neat name. What is that like? Polish or German or? I, I wonder. Have, I have no idea. It's an unusual name, but yeah, it's a lot easier to look up Jason <laughs> Osai. So, so you've got. Wh where was the fight at? One more time. Um, XKO. So Gas Monkey Live. Okay, Gas Monkey Live. Extreme Knockout Fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, you can search it on Google, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it will uh, come up. It will come up straight there. You know, it was an interesting fight. I I thought it was both of your guys' first fight, and and again, my opinion is totally. You know, probably useless, but uh, I I got the feeling that there's there's two uh, cautious uh, or aware fighters that have at least felt the power of a punch and and had been submitted. So it seemed like you were exhibiting the ability to avoid those positions um, and still come up with the, the victory and the decision at the end of the third round. I mean, really, what it was was you know i'm going against um going against a bigger guy like he was bigger than me in weight he was bigger than me in height and size he had a lot, <laughs> big dude he's a big dude he had the reach advantage of me so it's like you know if anything i went into that match at physical disadvantage mm -hmm. you know um which is hard to believe which is i mean i mean really guys i we're gonna have to get a picture of me standing next to you it's like <laughs> that day whenever a guy brought his kid to work you know <laughs> You're a pretty big guy, though. <laughs> All jokes aside. I mean, I'm a pretty big guy, but that guy was bigger, you know? And so <laughs> it's like, um, it was it was one of those things where it's a different tactic, you know? And, I mean, the main thing is to stay away from the power, which is, you know, why I was circling out. Because once you stay away from the power, then you kind of bring them into your power. So it's more like, you know, trying to set up the openings mm -hmm. and trying to, you know, because it's easy, like, you know, especially, like, with two heavy guys, to try and like you know go in waylay and try and like you know go in that gas way. Gas out. And yeah, exactly. You gas out really quickly, but instead it was kind of like more tactical in terms of like try and find the openings, try and make the openings. Because if you try and make the openings and you get like a good strike, then the fight can go in your favor, you know. And so it was kind of like using those kind of advantages where my advantage was like you know kind of being the light guy, kind of being like. Um, that guy, like, you know, why not use my, you know, my movement to my advantage mm -hmm. and try and, like, you know, kind of play that as my card 
and you know take my disadvantage away in size and use my advantage in like you know the um, I guess you can say nimbleness and you know have that be the factor you know you know that triggered something something you just said triggered uh, something I've heard Shane and Alan say at the gym is don't use your strength no. and they've said that I've heard them say that to you mm-hmm. um, and and I and I've, I know what they or they're talking about because there's a time whenever you know we're we're grappling against one of like the guys that are a little smaller. It's like let's say Brandon because his name comes up to 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 my na- to my head. Um, there there's a and Corey said something about this earlier. It kind of triggered me with the skill and the talent. Um, those guys have got both. <laughs> They've got both. But if you try to like just use all your your strength and your might you can overcome and get yourself into a better position but then what do you do Mm -hmm. because well i'll tell you what you do you get choked out or you get tapped out Mm -hmm. and i think that's um that's where a lot of people have to come to the realization that potential anybody can have potential like you know let's put let's let's put in like even like some more simple terms like you know like I have some ingredients and it could be the, it has the potential to be a good meal but if I don't put enough time and effort into actually like looking at the flavors and like actually making those ingredients into a good meal then it could potentially be a disaster mm-hmm. and it's the same thing with skill and talent like you know you can have the skill you can have the talent but if you don't put the time and effort into honing those skills and honing those talents then it could be an absolute disaster for you. And I think one thing that I think people overlook a lot of the time is that we like to see the fancy stuff or we like to see like the stuff that's um, like crazy and good, but they don't realize that, you know, a lot of it comes from the fundamentals. You know, if you have like the good building blocks, the solid foundations, like in, in fighting, the solid foundations is like, you know, leg kick, you know, jab, cross, straight. Like if you know those five things and you can do those five things well, then when it comes to like, you know, putting them together to like make combos, like, you know, where you can get different things then it becomes easier because you know the fundamentals and each time you can go back to the fundamentals because to be fair like when you're fighting or any sport that you do there's going to be one part where technique might go out the window and it's all about effort but if your fundamentals are more sound than the other person especially in that scenario then you're going to come out probably doing well because at the end of the day when you're tired you were able to go back to square one use those things and use them at a really high level and it was able to help you be successful. I think, you know, a lot of people, I mean, Shane preaches it, you know, Alan preaches it um, in terms of, like, number one, not using your strength. But mm-hmm. at the same time, you know, just using the fundamentals. Go back to, like, you know, all the things that made you successful in the first place and simplify it. You know, if you're, um, what Coach Clem at Baylor used to say all the time, like, focus small. Like, if the situation becomes this big, focus small. Like, you know, don't start thinking about the bigger picture because then this is when th- more things start to capitulate because you're trying to do too many things at once. You know, and for us as O line, what does focus small mean? It means like, hey, like when you're at the line of scrimmage, you know, and you know that we're about to call set hut, the play's going left, you want to step with your left foot first, you know, and that's it. Just take your first step, go with your left foot, and, um, and basically um, understand that, you know, I don't have to worry about like, you know, like making a highlight block. If I think about stepping left first, then everything will build off of that. Okay, left foot. Now I get my hands in. Now I get my feet moving. Now I do this. And it's like everything starts to become a progression as opposed to like, oh no, I need to go here and I need to pancake him. Because if you try and do that, then you probably might not. Um, it might not turn out the way you expected it. <laughs> it, it like I've seen it happen with guys that, you know, try to go and give all their might and fall flat in their face, you know? That's where the skill comes in, I guess, really, when it becomes mo- like a uh, muscle memory. Muscle memory, yeah. Your, it ju- your body just goes there. It's like like you were saying before we were off camera, you were talking to Corey about playing the guitar mm-hmm. and stuff, uh, and you're, you've are you done it so many times. You've trained your 10,000 hours on the guitar or whatever, uh, and your fingers automatically go into that position. Mm-hmm. Now, granted, there's some people that can just pick up a guitar or a harmonica and start playing immediately, right? But if they don't put the effort to, to learn, they don't have the discipline to, to watch the instructional videos or listen to the coach or take notes or do their homework, uh, they're not going to really ever progress from that point, uh, from what I've learned. But that being said, sometimes, especially whenever it comes to uh, one man against another, uh, raw talent and physical ability sometimes is an unstoppable force. And we see stuff like that. Like if you watch – if I don't know. If, of course you follow the UFC. 
Derek Lewis. Oh, yeah. Prime example, right? This guy, he, I mean, you could tell. Of course, he trains and he works hard and everything, but he's raw. He gets in there and he just knocks the shit out of people. Um, and there's not anything that you can do to stop it most of the times. There's the guy, Stipe. You mm-hmm. know, this guy works hard. He trains. I think he's, what's pretty cool about Stipe is like how he's, uh, he has a regular job. Yeah, he's, and he's a firefighter. Is he a firefighter? Yeah, he's a firefighter. I, I know he's like a family man and everything like that, but uh, it's just kind of cool stuff. But then he gets in the ring with – he's a, obviously a very hardworking, determined person. And he gets in the ring with somebody that says things like, my balls is hot. <laughs> and and uh, he gets knocked out, you know? I mean, and I think that's the – in talking about the Stipe fight, you know, when, um, when you kind of look at it, it was uh, – Gotcha. <laughs> My hair is fading. All right, guys, we are. I'm gonna see if you got uh, it. Like we you, are getting back you, in. Sorry, there I'm was a little bit of it technical though, man. difficulty. Losing it. Nah, what's this? Get uh, the way to hand. Keep it. I uh, the camera that I brought with us died, and uh, oh, we're back on. Oops, so yeah, yes, yeah, so we are back rolling. Uh, <laughs> I'll cut anything I need to, but uh, yeah. So we lost the camera due to I'm gonna blame it on the cold weather. Um. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> it's at my extra battery, so. It's Back all good. To Luke. We love you, Corey. He does so much, man. He does so much to make this this all happen. And uh, you know what? I need to say this. If you guys like what we do at all, uh, we've got a Patreon account set up. I'll explain more. We're going to have a, a introduction or introductory video where we explain those kinds of things. But it's really cool opportunity for our, our fans, our viewers to kind of give back. We need new equipment. You know, we need new cameras. We need extra batteries and stuff like that. But uh, it is a lot of fun, man. So thank you, Corey, for making this possible. And we, and we don't care if your cameras go out and we only have one. Uh, we'll we'll make it work. Thanks, buddy. So, w- what were we talking about before I knocked the uh, the camera off the stand? Oh, it wasn't you. It was the <laughs> it was me. Uh, I think that we were talking about the the dedication and the skill. Um, so, one of the biggest right. differences, um, especially we were kind of talking about it earlier about where. Um, really getting in and grinding it out. Uh, you know, you show up with the talent, but then you really hone in and gain the skill. And you see people like um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson and Gary Vaynerchuk talks. Very Gary Vaynerchuk talks about this about really grinding and gaining that skill and becoming uh, the best at what you're going to do. Because a lot of people come in really talented and. Some of them are really talented, and, and they, can, they can knock people down, like the guy you were talking about. But then you'll Lewis. see someone who comes in there with, like, actual skill and just cuts them off at the knee. And where that comes from is those people who are really dedicated to their cause, they're, they start winning. And when they're winning, it's because they're grinding it out. They're showing up every day. They're giving that 100% that uh, Jason is really talking about. They're showing up every day. They're, they're respecting their craft. They're respecting... The fact that they need to get in the gym every single day. They need to be sparring. They need to be losing because when you lose, you learn. And uh, really seeing that um, that spark in someone like Jason who is really competing at a higher level and he's wanting to pursue an even higher level uh, of guys that, you know, like he was talking about with the football where you get in and you're no longer with just like street fighters. I mean – you know, those football players, they were really good, and they were the, the cream of the crop, like he was saying. And um, it really goes to show you that there's uh, once he gets to that level of fighting, he's he might experience that again, but uh, we both have faith that this guy is going to rock and <laughs> roll whenever he gets in there. Is that right there, Jason? Yeah, what's that? I mean, as I said again, uh, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to always be prepared. And I think, um, like, what you were saying is, like, 100% right, you know. And then um, even then, I kind of thought while you, were, um, while you were talking about it. And the fact that, you know, confidence is a multiplier, and that's why we practice. You practice to be confident. Like, if you can go into a situation where you know you've given 100% of what you've done and you're confident in what your training has been and you're confident in your ability, then really the result is, like, an afterthought because it's, like, at this point right now, I've done everything I can – and so I'm going in there confident and 100% sure about what I'm doing. If you haven't put that effort in and you've kind of left stuff on the table, then you're always wondering if you've done enough 
up to this point to get there. And if you're kind of thinking about that as well as trying to think about what you're trying to do at the time, then you're probably not going to get the results that you want to. So I think um, as I get to that level, um, I'm definitely, and even at this level right now, I'm definitely like, you know, leaving no questions on the table. I don't want to come out thinking to myself like, hey, was that Thursday where I should have gone harder? Was that the reason why things didn't go my way? It's like, no, I'm going to put in that effort on that Thursday and make sure that, um, that make sure that, you know, that Thursday translates to the Saturday or whenever, like, you know, the competition day is Mm -hmm. and make sure that, you know, at that point, you know, I have done everything that I can to be at a point because if I'm confident going into it, then it doesn't really matter whether I win or lose. I, I win or lose, I can just say, hey, you know what? That person was just a better person that day. I just need to go back to the drawing board and get better myself. But if I've lost because I didn't put all my due diligence into it, it's, it, it's, it's worse because it starts, you know, it starts playing in your mind like, you know, like, wow, like, you know, I should have done this on this day. I should have done that on that day. It's a stupid loss or something like that. And so it's one of those things where you just don't, yeah, listen, I think at that point it's, don't leave any questions on the table. Don't leave anything to chance. Don't leave any. Don't, don't leave people wondering if that was your best that you gave out there. I think mm-hmm. that's the worst thing you can do. If you, if people have to wonder about if it's your best, then you might not be as good as you think you are. Like you know, you might be talented, but at the same time, do you ever do you have respect for your craft? Yeah. Have you ever had it um, a moment where you felt like you've been stuck in that rut that uh, I can't get things to work the way that I want to and I don't know how to to deal with it you, I mean I, feel I think fine. I think folks sometimes get caught in those kind of negative uh, vortexes uh, of uh, where they're not able to to do what they they set out to do and rather than refocusing or redirecting or maybe trying harder uh, I think folks can get discouraged sometimes. When they focus on that stuff I mean, too much, you you never you've never had that experience. I mean, do I have the experience where the stuff that I d- d- doesn't work like I wanted to do? I mean, mm-hmm. every day, like every day, like there is always something that I want to do better, or something that I want to go my way and it doesn't really go my way. But I always have to think to myself, there's more than one way to get somewhere, you know. Yeah. So if one way doesn't work, you know, I have to just go to Plan B, and if Plan B doesn't work, then Plan C, and like go through every plan until like this one. That, just doesn't work and then maybe at that point just kind of say you know what it is what it is but if i haven't exhausted every route to get there then i don't know if this i don't know that there's no solution so it's kind of like i can't i haven't got time to get discouraged about it if i've got time to get discouraged about it i've got time to think of a solution to it so like rather than spending time like you know kind of moping about it like you know find a way to find a way to win find a way to make it work you know when you do win like you just did recently uh do you ever have a situation where you catch yourself feeling yourself you're you i have a feeling that you're you're a well-rounded guy mm-hmm. uh I, and i feel like this might be a little bit of a, a redundant question but do you ever have that moment where you're like okay hold on i gotta recenter i i mean to be fair after the fight what happened you know yeah one i celebrated that night like you know in terms of just like you know being with family and friends and you know kind of like um just being able to like have a meal and like you know just kind of like sit down and relax (laughs) and know that training there was no training the next day for a fight but at the same time it's kind of like as as once that sunday hits it's like yeah okay like you know it's over now like you know have to focus on the next thing the next one and getting better you know and it's like in yeah there was a lot of good things you got you got a victory won but you know doesn't mean that i can't get better doesn't mean that if it doesn't mean that i fought perfectly you know there was probably some stuff that i could do better and that's the stuff that I need to start working on. Like, instead of, like, starting, instead of focusing so much on, yeah, I won, like, you know, I'm good and this and that and, like, you know, so forth like that. It's like, no, like, where where did I, where where did I make my mistakes? What, what did I not excel on? Did I do everything that I wanted to do? And it's like, at that point, then I have to start saying to myself, okay, all those things that I, I wanted to do personally, like, that I didn't do, those are the things that I need to start working on. And so it's, if, as I said again, it's, hey, short memory, get over it, you know, and start using that as my stepping stone to get into the next 
fight or get into the next thing that I need to do in terms of like, okay, I'm looking at it, looking at it, looking at it, but I'm not looking at it in terms of like, oh, yeah, look, let me see my work. Me, <laughs> what, what would you say your biggest weakness is as far as the fight game, you know, pursuing this, this craft? Have you – is there anything – I know you said something about you had an adrenaline dump. I don't know if your <laughs> your your stamina or or your ground game or is there anything that you think you you felt like after your first fight? Man, I noticed a, a an issue there, a lack there. Any any part of your game? I think probably like it was my first fight, so it's kind of hard to judge that at this stage. But I do think there was like um, times, especially like watching it again. And then even like hearing what the um, the commentators were saying, where I probably could have, I probably could have put the fight to bed a little bit earlier. Like adrenaline dump was a, was a factor, but it's, um, it's your first fight. And you're being uh, you, you're being careful and being smart to win the fight, and what you did. Yeah, which and 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 the thing is, it's like it's not discrediting myself or discrediting my opponent because, like, I mean, we. I did a lot of good things in the fight. At the same time, there was a lot more things I wanted to do that I didn't do. A lot of things that I felt that we had worked on that I wanted to do. The situation was a situation, and at the point, it is what it is. But I think probably my biggest weakness, I guess, was just the fact that I feel like um, there was, you know... There was some, there were some certain technical aspects that I want to clean up and polish mm-hmm. up, and I think that's really where it kind of like you know sets. There was some, some things I could have set up a lot better, um, like my kicks. You know, I definitely could have set those up a lot better. Like you know, I threw some of them a bit naked, and I got caught in the eye. You know, and then just my eye started to swell up and so forth. And in terms of like you know, kind of getting my head off center and so forth. And those, but those are things that we can work on. So it's not like there was like some glaring things where I just was like absolute trash. You know, like that's where you have to go back to the drawing board completely and start <laughs> refiguring everything but these are like little things that yeah um yeah they're, they're, they're little but major things that i'm going to keep on working on but it's like i mean i feel like that's a work in progress all the time because your head can never ever be too far off center to stop avoid getting hit you know you can never ever stop moving enough to stop getting hit. you can never ever stop throwing enough punches because mm. that's how you're gonna win so it's like everything is going to build everything's going to be a building block so actually in, in essence that question is there things i think i could improve everything <laughs> so your experience you need you I, basically you need more experience yeah but man i gotta tell you you're uh, you're really you seem to be a i've said it before i'll say it again i'll say it more in the future a really well-rounded humble person i think it's really cool that uh, we got a chance to bring you here on american inc so early in this new uh, journey that you're you're taking and uh Man, I can see all kinds of uh, great things come for Jason Osei in the future. But, man, thank you so much for coming out here. Hey, no, thank you so much for having me. You know, before we get out of here, uh, i got to ask, is there anything that you want to tell anybody watching out there before uh, we we cut? Well, I want to tell people this. I hey, man, if you have a dream, if you have something that you want to do, go with it at 100%. You know, also, I feel like... You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of excuses in the world that people can make and a lot of things that are going on. But at the same time, just understand that, you know, hey, you only have one chance at life. So make it a chance that you make it the life that you want it to be and make it sure that your life is full of happiness. And I think everything will go well. So, I mean, if you've got like tw- 2019, I challenge everybody. If you've got like beef with somebody, squash it. If you've got something that you're holding on to that's like weighing you down in life, forget it. If you got something that you want to do, do it. If you got something that you need to get over, get over it. You know, and if you, and also, I think the one thing that I learned, especially through this journey, is the importance of having a good support network. Don't be afraid to lean on people. You know, just if you lean on people, doesn't mean it's weakness. It means that it's actually strength because you actually understand that you've got people around you. Not we're humans. We're social creatures. We're never meant to live alone. So, like, you know, if you got something that's going in your mind or like something that you're you know, you can share with somebody, share it. Well, thank you. That's a really insightful uh, piece of information from you. Uh, we wish you the best. We know that there's great things coming for you. Jason Osai, thank you so much for coming out and seeing us. Hey, I know you've got a fight. You're going to be out there in April with our buddy Ryan. We're rooting for you. We're waiting for the next fight. Uh, you've got so many options. You've got so many things to do. We're going to keep an eye out for you. Uh, one more time, 
the folks, if you're looking for to see Jason Osei's fight, you can find it. Help, help me out here a little bit. Yeah, just Google it. Um, just Google my name, Jason Osei, and um, it will literally be there. You'll see probably a couple of videos pop up, but um, literally the main page is right there. Or you can go to xko.tv, search for um, Osei versus Finzen, and it's um, it's there for everybody to watch too. Can you spell that last name for us one more time? Or oh, my name? Yes, sir. Um, o S E I. <laughs> all right. All right. All right, well, that's a wrap. I'm Luke Wildman. This is American Inc. We'll see you guys on the flip side. Hey, thank you guys for hanging out. Uh, I'm Corey here. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, hit that like button if you liked it. If you did not like it, you know where that thumbs down button is. Give us a subscribe if you want to stick around and be notified when we upload a video. Uh, we're going to try to bring some more stuff to you pretty quick. Also, if you get a chance, we have a Patreon. I'll be linking down in the description below. And also check out our Facebook at American Inc. Uh, link will be in the description. Thank you, guys, and y'all have a wonderful evening. Goodbye.